Welcome to the Investing in Real Estate show. I'm Clayton Morris. This is the show where we aim to help you become a more intelligent real estate investor. That is the purpose of this show. And I think you'll find something here, even if you're a, a, an advanced investor or a young investor, there's something here for everyone. We've got a great guest on the show today. His name is Clint Coons. He's one of the founding partners of Anderson Law Group. And one of the things we're going to focus on today, most importantly, is asset protection. I hear from so many investors, so many clients who get into real estate investing and they just don't think about the long game. They think about the short term cash flow, make a quick buck, get rich quick is what they're thinking. They don't think long term how to protect your wealth in this crazy tumultuous environment because there are hawks out there. There are vultures that are floating around looking to pick you clean if you don't protect yourself. So Clint Coons has a long time experience. His success in these regards is a large part due to his personal investing experience who understands what it is to actually protect your investments as an investor himself. Taking what he learned growing up in the real estate family, he's acquired over 100 properties from single family homes to commercial buildings. And now he helps his clients protect their assets. Uh, Clint, well, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Right. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So walk us back a little bit. Give us a frame of reference. I mentioned, you know, over 100 properties. And, and anytime I, I, I have numbers from from someone, it's always changed since since you've typed that up. I know, <laughs> I, you right? Know, people interview me and I, they're like, so you've done this and I know it's now changed. So walk us back a little bit. Give us a, a little history on how you got into real estate investing and then obviously the legal side of this, what compelled you to move in that direction and then to become so passionate about helping other people protect their assets? Sure. Yeah. I always tell people that I got started when I was probably six because my father was an investor and I think he just wanted to have a couple of sons to be indentured servants for 23 years. And so that was my first foray into investing, just working on his rentals. In fact, I got really heavy in the sports just so I could get out of having to go and work in an apartment building or something after school. And so then when I uh, graduated law school, I decided that I wanted to focus on the asset protection, tax planning for investors because right out of law school, the first thing my father asked me to do was protect his stuff. I mean, he sat down with me, he goes, listen, you need to get this all protected. You're, you, you, now you're on permanent retainer for life. You do everything for free, of course, because I sent you to school. And he said, you better do it right because if you screw it up, you won't be inheriting anything. Uh, meaning that if there was a lawsuit and uh, he lost it. And, and that was really born out of the fact that my grandfather, his father was an attorney. He never once helped my dad uh, navigate these issues. And then the way they would handle things is just settle. Uh, if you got sued because of a disgruntled tenant or you didn't have any bailment there for, for items they left behind, he would just settle to make it go away. So that became my passion. And then from there, it's like, well, I got to start investing myself. I, I saw the value in it. My dad retired at his age 50. And I realized this is something that can create generational wealth and it can create you know, exceptional retirement income. And having gone through the stock market back in 99, where I had this account where I thought I was going to retire in the market. I bought it from a little under 100,000, close to a million bucks in six months trading naked options. And then I get on a plane to fly to Orlando. And in the six hour span, I lose it 70, 80% of it just gone. And so that taught me something that, hey, you know, stock market's fine for some people, but for me, it's real estate. And so that really, you know, started me going. And, I, and the first property I bought, was in Memphis, Tennessee back in 2009. It was a cool steal. I, I was like $2,000 down and I was able to buy a $95,000 house, you know, remodeled it, got a tenant into it, uh, took out the hard money lender with traditional financing. And that, that's all I had to put in to get my first rental property. And then I was clearing about 500 bucks a month off the deal. And so from there, it was just, you know, all over the US started buying. And now it's closer to 200 properties. And I don't know how many doors now, it's 300 and some doors uh, that, that we have. Right. We, we lose track of that. <laughs> Let's get into the point. Um, what's early on, what was one big mistake that you made or did you, were you able to avoid that with your schooling, with your legal background, or did you make some early false starts? Well, yeah, you know, in, in investing, the biggest mistake that I made when I first started out is that. I would go into markets and I didn't fully understand the market. And I remember Indianapolis was the first, one of the, the second place that I went to start investing. And I went into that market and I had a property manager that I didn't fully vet. 
uh, that was going to manage my properties. And for the first eight months, he stole all the rents. In fact, he died <laughs> during this time. He died and then his kids were stealing from me. And every time I would call up, it was always the same. You know, uh, the tenants aren't paying. We're having a problem with this. We're going kicked them out, you know, unlawful detainer, blah, blah, blah. And finally, I got on a plane. And I flew out there and I went to one of my houses and I knocked on the door and somebody answered and said, who the hell are you? <laughs> he goes, I, li I, I live here. I'm renting this place. For how long? Well, I've been here six months. I was like, interesting. And then I, then I found out the story. So that, so it taught me, if, you know, if you're going to go into a market, you really have to spend the time there to understand it. You should, if, you, if you're not working with experienced individuals. And I was just trying to wing it on my own at that point in time. And so, you know, it was a, it was a lesson that I learned from that. But I carried it with me. And it, it really changed how I invest going forwards from that point on. I think maybe we all have an Indianapolis story in our back pocket uh, of getting burned. So I feel your pain in almost a strikingly similar fashion, by the way. So oh, I've got man. I've got those knives in my back as well. But, you know, we learn through those scars and we learn, you know, to build from there and to continue on. So as you move forward and you started to acquire properties, what did you find that was so important from a from an asset protection uh, perspective? that you were doing that you noticed maybe that other investors weren't doing? Well, you know, so what I was doing was wrong to begin with. So when I started investing, you know, I gave you that deal there that I did in Memphis. Well, that taught me something about what I was focused on. Because if we went back a few more years, when I got out of law school and I started Anderson, um, for the first couple of years, I paid zero in federal income tax. I was able to defer my income and do things from an income recognition standpoint where I could bring in $500,000, $750,000 and pay zero federal income tax. And I thought, you know, look how smart I am. And I, I would teach events and then people would come to the events and say, how many people want to pay zero in tax? And everybody's going to raise their hand because no one wants to pay federal income tax. Well, try to go to a lender and obtain financing when they ask you for two years of your tax returns and they look at them and they say, you make no money. I mean, there's certain things, you know, you can deduct, you, they'll add back in, but there's certain things that do not count. And I was in that category where they were looking at me and I had to explain to them, I am making money. It just doesn't show up there as taxable income. So then they figured maybe I was cheating. And so it really took me out of the, the game altogether for, for a period of time there where I had to change my, my tax planning strategy to focus on showing the right type of income, taking the right type of deduction so I can start growing my portfolio. Because initially when people are starting out, like when I was starting out, I was using traditional lenders. Before you moved into the portfolio lenders out there and you, and you start doing different larger deals, that was a, a challenge that I had to overcome. And, I, and, and actually in hindsight, it worked out for me because I missed out on that period of investing where the market just shot up from 2005 to 2007 a lot of people got burned, um, I, I struggled to participate because uh, of my taxes. And that's what I tell investors a lot of time is don't let the taxes, you know, drive your decision making. Your decision making on what you're doing with real estate investing should be more about business planning, understanding that it is a business. And that when you're, when you're looking at your tax situation, there are things that you might be able to do that are going to save you a few bucks, but at what cost? And, and for a lot of people, their CPAs just don't get this. I see it all the time because they don't understand what it means to be a real estate investor. Where do you see the biggest uh, friction there? I, I, have, I work with a fantastic CPA who mm -hmm. understands real estate investing at a very high level. And I think that's one of the most important things I always try to tell my audience is, you know, if your CPA doesn't understand real estate investing, you can't train them. Like, are you going to start sending them books in the mail to read? Like, you may have to find another You're CPA. Not. Where do you see the biggest friction between the legal side and the CPA side? Well, it all comes down to the fact that legal CPA side of it, are they real estate investors themselves? I tell mm -hmm. people that. If you interview them, ask them, how many properties do you own? Use the terms that a lot of people use who invest. If you're into house hacking, ask them if they do that. Uh, if you're a Burr strategy investor, ask them if they understand Burr strategy, wholesaling, flipping. How many of your clients are doing that? What are some of the strategies you use to help those clients achieve their goals and make it more of an interview process? Because you'll find many times that if they don't understand it, if they're not up on it, the safest position for them is going to be down on it. Like if you call a bank and say, hey, can I uh, do this 
with with a mortgage or transfer property that's encumbered? The answer is going to be no, because that's the safest answer for them. So I think the, the friction for, for individuals, investors, and in finding those people like you have is that so many of them will say, I work with real estate investors, but they truly don't understand what it means to be a real estate investor and that preparing tax returns. I, I dealt with, and this was something that I didn't realize at first. I thought it was the greatest thing to have disregarded LLC set up where you don't have to file tax returns. And so you know, back in my early career, I would tell people, hey, put your property in a disregarded limited liability company, which means it doesn't have to file a return. And then everything shows up on your Schedule E so you don't have to pay a CPA. I thought that was cool. I'm just looking at it from a cost standpoint, not understanding that there's an investment aspect to this, that by filing a tax return, a 1065 that gives you a K-1, you're actually putting yourself in a better position. So you spend a thousand bucks, but what do you get out of that? You get the ability to go in and, and work with the traditional lender who's going to write you Freddie Fannie qualifying stuff, and they're going to give you 100% for your income, rental income, rather than hold back 25%. You're going to reduce your risk of audit by having that K-1. And then when you move up and you start working on larger deals, you're going to look like a serious investor. So when they're looking at your taxes returns or your financial statements, they're going to know by the way you prepare it that you understand it because you're going to model what the more successful people are doing in real estate. And you're going to have that appearance because as you know, when you get into larger deals and you start working with the core best of the world, they're going to be looking at you and wanted to know your experience factor. If they're going to loan you $6 million to take a deal down. So your tax returns can help prove that just by the way you carry your income. A couple of big nuggets there. Clearly, as you pointed out earlier, You've gotten burned on the lending side of things. So you've got your battle scars to understand how you can best position yourself. And that's one of the things that you teach and one of the things that you work with your clients at Anderson, which is fantastic, being able to position yourself so you're able to get maximum leverage. And who wouldn't want it at this stage when interest rates are where they are? I mean, you're basically getting free money and it looks like this is going to continue for a number of years at this level without much movement. So we have an unbelievable opportunity right now to use other people's money to build our portfolio. And one other little nugget there that I love that you said, which, uh, you know, CPAs, if they don't understand something, if they're not up on it, then they're usually down on it. And that goes for just people. I, I'm going to, I'm going to write that down and keep that on my wall because that, that just doesn't go just for CPAs. That goes for an uncle who tells you not to invest in real estate because he heard a rumor one time that investing in real estate is bad, but he doesn't have any experience on it, or anyone who's not read a book on a subject but who likes to weigh in on that subject, you know, like to, mm -hmm. so that that carries across all facets of life, doesn't it? It does, and a lot of the people in the media. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> I'll experience with that after twenty years, exactly. Who don't know what they're talking about? Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned a couple of things about house hacking. And I, that's a question I get an awful lot from our audience. And I always preface it by saying, I'm not a lawyer, seek the you know, legal representation before, uh, before making a move on this. But house hacking, being able to put that property into an LLC or some other uh, asset protection um, uh, vehicle, while you're living in one side of the property, a duplex, a quadplex, a threeplex, whatever it happens to be, cash flowing the other, it's a great way to get started with real estate investing. Can you answer that for us once and for all? Am I able to get it to move this into an LLC, even maybe perhaps before closing or after closing to protect myself? What do you advise your clients on that question? It depends how you're buying. Um, so if, if you're buying for cash, yeah, absolutely, you can buy it in the LLC directly at the outset. But if you're financing, and again, if it's a, with a broker and it's going to be Freddie Fannie stuff, you're not going to be able to, oh, you could move it, but if they caught it, if you moved it within a year, so let's say you, you, got, you took out a loan, you're going to claim it's going to be your personal residence. Uh, therefore, when they write those types of loans for, for a residence, then you're prohibited from transferring that property for a year into a limited liability company. And some people get concerned about that because the bank, if they caught it, they could exercise the due on sale clause and then accelerate the mortgage. And, and you know, with interest rates to where they are, not a lot of movement there. I doubt that would happen. But if people are concerned, what I'll tell them is, well, maybe put it into a land trust, put it into a trust, and then we'll put the trust into the LLC. And that's that's a, a way to, to get the protection of the LLC without alerting the bank the fact there's been a transfer. And so that's a common strategy we'll utilize there. That's great. Yeah. The land trust is such a, a, a really smart play on that. So let's talk about asset protection. 
big mistakes that you're seeing people making from, you know, as they're getting started, they've got one or two or three properties. Where do you, when you first start meeting with a client at Anderson and your team starts working with someone who's a real estate investor and is looking to maximize their, you know, their portfolio, protecting their wealth. I like to just talk about it as protecting your wealth at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at with printing of money like crazy by the federal government right now. All this volatility, government $30 trillion in debt, US dollar going down in value just about every day. Real estate to me is one of the ultimate stores of value. So we want to protect that. What kind of common mistakes are you seeing them make at the beginning? And how do you, how do you analyze that and help them adjust when you start working with them? Well, first off is the, the idea that insurance is going to protect you. You see a lot of attorneys that say, just load up on insurance and, and that's all you need. And that is a mistake because a lot of the claims that get brought against real estate investors many times aren't even covered by the policy. And so people don't know that because they never read their policy and they're shocked to find out that, you know, the dog bite example, where it's a vicious animal, it's classified as a vicious animal. So they don't uh, provide coverage because the tenant had a Rottweiler. But beyond that, it's when it comes to structuring and people start putting together entities, limited liability companies for their properties, your example, three properties, they fall into this trap that I myself used to be in. I would tell people, you know, going back 18 years ago, I would say, hey, if you've got three properties, look at the equity in those properties. And if it's, you know, less than $250,000, set up one limited liability company. Because I was looking at it from that, that cost mindset, you know, how much, you know, I can save them money, you know, it's $1,500 to set up an LLC. So rather than spend 4,500, one for each uh, property, we'll just spend 15 and put all three in there because the total equity in those three properties is only about $190,000. That's really what they had at risk. And then as I started investing more, as my investing started growing, I realized that I didn't, I wasn't investing for equity because a lot of the properties that I own, you know, Memphis, yeah, that was good appreciation in that market. But uh, in Winston-Salem, for example, North Carolina, not a lot of appreciation. I buy for cash flow. And I had this epiphany that, you know, you don't want to stick three properties in one LLC. You should put each property in its own LLC because at the end of the day, the reason I'm buying these homes is to have that $500 or that $400 a month that's coming in off the property. And if something were to happen on one of those properties of those three properties, and currently if I'm pulling in $1,500K or $1,500 a month, you know, what does that equal? That's 18,000 a year. I've just lost all of that income. Whereas if I had each property in its own LLC, I'm going to lose a third of that income, but I'm still going to have a cash flow coming in. And I tell people, I said, you need to look at it from that standpoint. If you're investing for income, then you need to protect that income. You should not group properties. I don't care what the equity is. And that's where a lot of attorneys, I think, make mistakes and CPAs. They'll tell people, well, the equity isn't that much in the property, so put three or four together. No, no, wrong analysis. Look at the income you're generating it because it's hard to go from $18,000 a year to zero. That sucks. It's no, I mean, no one wants to go from $18,000 a year to 12,000, but it's still, it's still 12,000. And then when you get to a certain level of investing where I'm at right now, now I don't mind putting five or 10 properties in one LLC. And the reason why is because at my level, I can risk 10 properties. It doesn't, it's not going to impact whether I'm going to Europe next year or I'm going out to dinner next week. And if I'm buying a $150 bottle of wine, it ain't changing anything if I lost 10 properties because I have enough cash flow coming in off the other 190. It's not going to change my lifestyle. But for the new investor, you've worked for seven, eight years, and now you've got three, four, five properties that are producing cash flow. So you think maybe one of your spouses can now retire, give up their job, you're out of it. And a lot of people, you know, when I teach events on this, they come up to me at breaks. And I always know that look, that person that has a story to tell. And I right. know the ending before <laughs> they even start right. just by the look in their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, that, absolutely the case. And I think it's so important at the beginning, you, you hit on something. The reason I brought up three properties is because it's you get into that mentality at the beginning where you think, well, I'll just, I want to save some money. I want to lump this together. And if you're investing for that cash flow, it's incredibly important to think about how you can protect that. What if you though are, you know, a doctor and 
somebody who's made a lot of money, we know a lot of doctors who listen to the show, they will attest they're not very good with their money. So they've been, you know, they've been busy working 20 hours a day, but they have no idea how to invest. And so they're at one point, they're looking for a tax shelter. They're not necessarily concerned with the cash flow. They're looking to just put, sink their money into investments as a tax shelter. Does the strategy change at all from that perspective? Well, I mean, it doesn't necessarily change if they're buying and owning the real estate. So one of the things that I, I run into a lot with physicians is that they want to uh, be classified as a real estate professional. They right. want to say, hey, I meet real estate professional status, so we're going to take a cost seg on our properties, create all these deductions, and I'm going to wipe out my W-2 income or a good chunk of it that I generate from my professional practice or the hospital that's paying me. And the issue that comes up for these individuals that I work with is that they don't, they're never going to meet the test because they're full-time as a doctor. And if they're still working as that, that physician, they, they can't meet the 750 hours, 50% of your time devoted to real estate-related activities, or they're buying out of state. And so they, they're not managing the properties themselves. So automatically, they don't qualify. So then I tell them, I said, you want to look at different types of investing then. Maybe the the buy and hold single family stuff isn't for you. Maybe we should look at Airbnb. And then what you do with the Airbnb side is we make sure you materially participate, which means you just have to spend a hundred hours or working on it, on these investments. And then we'll 179 all the stuff you're putting into it and create some nice tax deductions for you on that side that you can use against your W-2 income. And then next year, if you want to become, uh, you want to step back and have it professionally managed, great. Let someone else take over. But this year, we'll capture a bunch of deductions for you because we'll just change the nature of the investment activity. We'll choose an activity that is classified as an active business that we can then put you into from a material participation standpoint. So it's understanding those nuances for the position that I work with uh, on their investing that we explore. So tax shelters, I mean, yeah, it's great. If you're just looking for the income, which you know many of them are, then they go into syndications. Um, right. And then you just look for something that has sufficient depreciation. And most syndicators now are, you know, they're, they're, they're doing the cost segs on those properties and wiping out a ton of that income. Yeah. Or they're having their spouse become the real estate professional who stays at home and, and doesn't have a job and then they qualify. <laughs> yeah, they, I know, right? I talked to one of my physician clients this week and he said that's been a point of contention because he'll ask his wife, you know, how many hours did you put in this week? And right. he doesn't mean it in the sense that he's trying to check in. He's just wanting to make sure that she's logging her hours because, you know, he, he understands how the IRS scrutinizes that 750 hour requirement. And I said, man, that's not the question you need to be asking. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But the, you, know, you bring up a good point about the IRS. And, and we know now with digital, the digital tools that are at their at the ready, they're begging for a lot more money right now. Audits are going to be on absolutely on the rise. This yep. IRS is not fooling around. Um, we're, I know that maybe it's a CPA question, but I guess on the legal side, how do you prepare your clients for that? Well, this is what I tell them. First off, I, I talked about using a, a K-1. So we'll set up an LLC as a holding company. I'll typically set it up in Delaware, Wyoming, and then I'll own all of their other LLCs. And so they're filing one tax return for all of their properties. And then that gives them a K-1. So you reduce your risk of audit there. Because when it comes to being audited, 90% of the IRS, the agents, are focused on 1040s. And so I want to get you out of the audit pool just by putting you onto a 1065. So that helps reduce the risk of being audited because that's where we're taking all of our major deductions off of our real estate is at that upper tier entity. And then it just passes down to you on a K-1. So I, I focus on how the returns look. And then I just explained to him, I said, you know, some of these strategies that are out there, you have to balance that. As you stated, as long as, you know, the Senate is in the hands of the Democrats as it is right now. You have this guy named Ron Wyden that's in charge of the Senate Finance Committee. And if you were to, to go back, what was it, about eight to 10 years ago, when, again, he was in charge before they lost power, the guy was a pit bull. He came out after real estate investors. In fact, he changed uh, the reporting requirement for IRAs, 5498, and added a few extra boxes on there just to track how many people were buying real estate inside of their self-directed IRA. And now you have to, now all your IRA custodians are reporting this information to the IRS. 
Well, when the Senate changed hands, all of those uh, tax court cases and audits of real estate investors, they tapered off. And you wouldn't see all the, the you know, especially people are claiming real estate professional status. Uh, the IRS was going after them and saying, well, you didn't make an aggregation election on your return. So now we're only going to count the hours on these individual properties and not, you didn't have 750 hours per property, but you did in the aggregate. Well, if you, without an aggregation election, it doesn't count. And so you just saw these moves that the IRS was making that I thought were very aggressive that they hadn't done in the past. And it was all under the state admission that we'll just enforce the tax code. And that's how we're going to plug the deficit. And now I think you're going to see some more of that start up. I mean, well, you've got a midterm election coming up and we'll see what happens there. But if you look at what they're saying that comes out of the Senate Finance Committee, they're really against the capitalistic system and people making money saying, hey, you can't have more than a million dollars for a retirement plan. That's too much money. You shouldn't need that more than that for retirement. Who the hell makes that decision for me? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're going to live off a million dollars for 20 years? Yeah, no, you're right. not. No, you're not. I think even Susie Orman at one point was asked, like, how much would you actually need to live off of? She said, not even six million is enough to live off of. And people, you know, living longer and longer. And you mentioned the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, you talk, the, you know, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, of course, on that as well. And she's been pushing for uh, stricter, stricter audits. She wants more money in the hands of the IRS to go after tax cheats, which more, you know, more audits. And we know that they fall disproportionately on people who are not billionaires. <laughs> they, right. they fall, these audits mostly fall on people who are the small business owners. They are, uh, in fact, lower income Americans end up getting audited more than, more so than billionaires do. So this is who is going to di be disproportionately hit by some of these changes in the Senate. Well, because they can't afford many times to hire someone to represent them. I've been in front of the IRS before in that scenario. And one of the things that I said, I said, hey, you know, bring a CPA with you because what we're going to be talking about, I know you're not going to understand it. And I was sitting there and I was diagramming out what we're doing and, and what I teach clients because they were doing an audit on, on the firm. This is probably about 17 years ago. And the agent would say, you can't do that. I just stand back and I look over at the CPA and I said, what do you want to tell her? She goes, oh, yeah, you can do that. And so it was just a <laughs> common theme. And then finally, she just quit challenging me on, on the stuff that I was doing. And it was just, it was really enlightening. And, and I tell people that unless you're in a position, as you stated, to be able to defend yourself and put the money forth, um, it makes it really difficult. And they know that. So they shake down the people that are not going to be able to put up a defense. It's so sad too. And I've heard one of, you know, our, our CPA and who's one of the, really one of the most talented CPAs in the country, he said, you know, the, the IRS, he, and he used to work at the treasury, the IRS hires C-class, C-level accountants. You yep. want to have an A-level accountant in your corner. And that's the truth. I mean, if you're an A-level accountant, you don't work for the IRS. Chances are you probably have your own firm, if you think at the end of the day. Well, Clint, um, I, uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I, I could continue on and on with this. I'd love to have you back on a regular basis, certainly as some of these laws change and we, we see different cities and, and different counties and different states moving in different directions with real estate. So maybe we could dive deeper on that for investors the next time we have you on. But any final words on how people can connect with you? Um, the website is andersonadvisors.com. What's the best way to connect with you if they want to work with you? Yeah, they can just go there. They can sign up for a free strategy session or they can check out my YouTube channel. Just type in my name in YouTube, Real Estate Asset Protection. Uh, I got a ton of free information up there for, for individual investors to, to watch and learn about the things that you and I were talking about. Awesome. Well, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you, Clint. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. You bet. And thanks to all of you for downloading and subscribing. We really appreciate it. I hope you took a lot of these, uh, I took some heavy notes here from what Clint had to say. Go back, rewind. There was a lot of real gems in this uh, discussion today and connect with Clint on his website, andersonadvisors.com. Now go out there, take action, become a real estate investor. I believe it's the number one, to, number one way to build wealth. Most importantly, the number one way to preserve wealth. We'll see you next time, everyone.